Um, so this talk will be about, uh, titled Demystifying Threats, Cold Stack Spoofing, will be about, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the technique known and, as stack spoofing, uh, which is an evasion technique. Before starting, a few words about me. I'm Alessandro. This fancy guy is an AI-generated avatar, of course. Um, I'm a principal security consultant in uh, BSI, where I serve as a red teamer, malware developer, and source code reviewer. Because work is never enough, I also work in Porchetta Industry with Marcello Salvati, where I maintain some uh, open source tool. Um, and I, as a bug bounty hunter for, for Cynic Red Team. I go as Clats Virus. If you want to drop a message after this talk, uh, feel free to do that. Um, so today, what we will talk about, I will give you an introduction uh, about, the, about stack spoofing, what it is, why we want to use it, um, and then to explain this technique a bit more, I will uh, give you some, an overview about the relevant Windows internals and the Windows ABI, uh, especially talking about the calling convention, the stack management. And then we will see some, some stack spoofing approaches that have been released in, in the past. And after that, I will give you an overview of the technique that we refer to as stack moonwalking, which is kind of a new technique. We developed the POC um, not long ago. And after that, I will also talk about the some. I will give you some defensive consideration, uh, some direction for future research, and I will discuss the impact of uh, hardware enforced stack protection on all these threat stack spoofing techniques. So let's start. I'll start with two questions. Uh, the first one is why threat called stack spoofing? Why not just stack spoofing? Of course, the terms are interchangeable. Uh, and the reason is that the thread is the main unit in the Windows operating system that executes code, is the thread, every thread inside, of, like the process acts as, as a container, and we have a lot of threads um, that all maintains a, their own respective stack. Uh, cold stack, of course, is, the cold stack, of course, is something like this, is a, like, a sequence, um, like a, a sequential um, memory space. And what, whenever you call a function in a programming language, what happens uh, is that the function allocates some space on the stack to handle parameters, the locals, save the context from the previous uh, function, some, something that we refer to as like non-volatile registers. And by calling nested functions, of course, because when you call an API, of course, this recursively call another function that calls another function, you create a call stack. And spoofing, because of course we want to somehow tamper this cold stack in order to avoid some sort of detection mechanism. And the motivation is always detection. Yes, so if you use something like this, is a vanilla process injection um, technique, uh, and you can see the reference here. Uh, very easy to understand. It can be process injection or self-injection, it doesn't matter. If you locate something on the heap and you try to execute something from there, you will see that your thread stack, cold stack, will show something like this. Doesn't okay, something like this. So some garbage in the cold stack, and the reason is because there is no exception information associated for something that you allocated dynamically in memory. We will talk about that more in the next slides. And so you have a message box like coming from nowhere. And of course, this means like this this cold stack is invalid because it doesn't and win to the bottom, as we say, because like a valid cold stack should look like this, where you can actually locate the start of the thread uh, by RTL, like locating RTL user thread stack, which is usually the first frame of any cold stack because uh, you, it's, it's the way you actually create a thread in the Windows operating system in user land. And so we have this in-memory execution kind of detection where you locate some garbage in the code because the cold stack doesn't uh, unwin correctly, but you can also have, like broadly speaking, you also have color detection. Sometimes you can enforce some rules to avoid a specific um, a specific uh, call to, uh, like that there is originating from a specific color, and you can block that. Or you have direct and indirect syscall detection because analyzing the cold stack, you can understand the path 
that a specific call has taken uh, in, in the thread. So you can understand if, it was, if it's originating by a module instead of passing through kernel base. But also important to understand is where this detection, <clears throat> where, when this detection can happen. And there are mainly three techniques to detect this stack spoofing. One is periodic. You select a frame, uh, a time period T, and every T seconds you just uh, system-wide scan all the, process, all the processes. You stop every thread in the process. <clears throat> Sorry for that. Um, probably need some water. And... Um, and you analyze their cold stack. So this is not as impacting uh, on performance as you may expect. But if you're worried about impacting the system performances, you can just decide to do a conditional periodic scan. So the EDR just scan uh, threads that are in a, in a specific state. So if you if you ever heard about the tool named Ant for Sleeping Beacons, this is a technique that is used in that tool, for example, that just, uh, just loops through all the threads. It detects the threads that are in a wait state, user-requested wait state. That means that like the state was introduced by a call to wait for single object or similar. And or an ent or just delayed execution. So you have a sleep and it will just scan that kind of threads to uh, to analyze for to to hunt for uh, sleeping beacons and the same can apply to the cold, the cold stack analysis it's not working anymore it's incredible just just uh finish the battery probably so and then you have the hooking uh, of course, you can you can also do this inspection in using another approach, which is via hooking. Uh, when I say hooking, can be user level hooking. So when when a when a call is when when a specific call is hooked and the hook is hit, uh, you can trace back the call stack, which is something you can do, for example, for with Frida if you if you're interested in doing something like that. Um, uh, of, of, or, or otherwise, you can do kernel-based hooking, which is something you can do with D-Trace, for example, where you, a system call, a specific, a specific system call is it, you can trace back the execution and analyze where it's coming from. And turns out, sorry, just to stay here for a second, and it turns out that in the, in, like in, in the field, we developed a lot of techniques to defend against conditional scanning and periodic scanning, but we don't have a lot of techniques to defend against, for example, uh, tracing done at kernel level or by hooking. So before going further, uh, let's just define a bit of uh, prerequisites because this is a user friend, like a beginner friendly talk. So uh, we will talk about the calling convention a bit, which we need for understanding things further. So of course, the Windows 64 calling convention, uh, if you're used to 32-bit uh, Windows, uh, it's a bit different. Uh, so in Windows, of course, you had this, um, like the calling convention defined that you could push all the register, for all the parameters for a function call directly on the stack and then push the return address and call the function. In 64 bits, it's a bit different. You use the fast call calling convention. And uh, this fast call defined that the first four parameters get passed to R8, R9, uh, sorry, uh, RCX, RDX, R8, and R9, which are called the fast call uh, registers. Uh, then there are other, like non volatile, re like the other uh, parameters are all pushed on the stack, but after something that we call homing space, which is the space that would require to handle these first four. Um, registered in case they need to be pushed on the stack. Um, so, and the, the main difference though between 64 and 32 is the usage of EBP potentially, and this is what we care the most. Uh, in 32-bit, in, in you have the EBP acting as a base pointer, of course, extended base pointer, you would expect that is a base pointer, but in 64-bit, this is no longer the case. So if you remember in 32 bits, every prologue was actually starting by push RBP, move EBP, ESP, and that was literally moving and allocating a and starting the allocation of a frame by just resetting the base pointer and extending ESP then to 
to some to to the value that needs to uh, to be to be like the value that needs to be allocated on the stack. But this is no longer the case because in 64 bits you have RSP acting as both the base pointer and the stack pointer. Um, and so, sorry, this is just for defining the against the parameters. And so, what happens when you call uh, a function? You have just like this 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 call sequence. Like you call a function from a fun from a function A, call a function B, and you can see that the the function A will take care of allocating the stack parameters, leave the home space, push its return address, and then pass execution to the frame of function B, where you have Mm, the space for allocating non-volatile registers and additional locals. So important for this is that uh, all the instructions need and needed uh, for, for function B to push non-volatile registers and allocate space for locals is called prolog. Practically, is the is the is 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 the is the part of uh, a function that is responsible for allocating everything that is needed for the function execution. After the prolog, RSP is static for the full uh, execution of B. And this is needed exactly because RSP is base pointer and stack pointer, and you can just uh, do modification within the body of a function, otherwise you would lose all references. Because as you can see from this, from this image, everything is actually referred within a function as a reference to RSP. So you can just modify it arbitrarily. And, uh, and, and because RSP is used both as a base pointer and a stack pointer, you can also use the base pointer to trace back execution and unwind the stack, so to locate all the cold stack. So in 32 bits, what you would do is just because there was this function paradigm, you pushed RBP, you move uh, RBP, like sorry, you move uh, ESP into EBP, etc. You could do the same thing on the contrary. So at a certain point, EBP was also was always pushed on the stack, and ESP moved, and EBP moved to to ESP, and ESP moved back. So. If you wanted to call, if you wanted to trace the old call stack, you just needed to literally locate the address where EBP was pushed, get the EBP, and trace back again, and do this process until you reach the um, the bottom of the stack. So you could just follow the what we call the chain of EBP pointers. But in this case, we don't have this information anymore because uh, RSP is. Is is not like EBP is not is not used anymore. Like RBP is just a, a global um, a general purpose register. So to keep track of this call stack, uh, Windows introduced a new unwinding algorithm, uh, which is uh, an um, which is an algorithm that is actually responsible for detect for understanding and detecting based on the current location of the program and the current frame to actually virtually reconstruct the cold stack. And this works because whenever you uh, create a, pro uh, a program, uh, the compiler automatically creates a section, actually two, uh, like a section that is called P data with the and X data, uh, but let's just say P data to simplify, uh, that contains all the instructions that are, um, that are relevant to a specific function prolog. Uh, what, why the prolog? Because as we said, RSP is static through the body, so all the information related to the stack frame sites are in the are defined are a, are a direct function of the operations performed in a prolog of a function. So if this is not clear, I, I hope it will be now. So practically, the p data uh, the p data section uh, contains an exception uh, a directory called exception directory. And this exception directory maintains a table, uh, runtime function table, with, all the, with a list of all these runtime functions. You can imagine that every runtime function is a function in your PE. Uh, it can be an export, or it may be just a function, an internal function used by the PE. And this uh, 
There, there, are, there is an exception actually, because Windows also uh, define non like leaf and non leaf function. Of course, you may you may like because this is an exception kind directory. This contains information about the exceptions uh, of any function and about all the all, all the things all the all the function that allocate that space on the stack. So you can infer does like the question is does every function need a stack frame? Well, no. Windows also support leaf what what is called as a leaf function. So how can I understand if a function is a leaf or not? So if there is a function entering the runtime function table is a non-leaf function. If there is no function entry for that specific function, well then it's a non-leaf function. Uh, and how like what is contained in this runtime function structure? So the runtime function structure is 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 like that. So you have is a is a structure containing the begin address of a function, the end address of a function, and another structure which is unwind data structure. And this unwind data structure contains a lot of very good, very interesting information, uh, useful for the OS because of course they are needed for exception handling and just roll, rolling back the the stack frames that are needed to be rolled back. Uh, and what we care about this is that in this uh, in this structure we have the unwind data, which is an unwind infrastructure, and in this unwind infrastructure we have the unwind code array. And the unwind code array is the list of instructions that are performed within the prologue of a function. Why this is important? Because if we loop through all these unwind code structures we can locate based on the operation info and the operation code, we can understand all the operations that add an impact on the stack. And the operation that add an impact on the stack are, for example, push on ball, which of course extend the stack size, the stack frame size of eight. And then we have alloc small and alloc large that can extend of an arbitrary uh, number based on the allocation that was needed for uh, for for the function, and by looping through all of this, we can dynamically detect a stack frame size. Once we detect the stack frame size, we can locate the return address, get the return address, and do this again for the uh, previous uh, stack frame. And by doing this till the bottom, we can just uh, detect all the cold stack. This is the unwinding algorithm. A bit a bit complex. Um, if you ask me, it was very, it was way easier to do to analyze the chain of EB pointers. But this is for, this is what they came up with. Okay, so uh, now let's just briefly talk about. Now that we know about this, we are expert of the um, unwinding algorithm. Let's just talk about a bit about uh, what what are the um, the approaches so far that were released to track tax spoofing. So the first one, probably, and the most famous, I would say, is uh, Thread Stack Spoofer by MGG, uh, Marius. Um, and this technique is actually, um, it was developed to defend against on-sleep, like conditional scans, periodical scans. And what this, uh, what this does, uh, we, we, I, I categorize this, uh, this technique as stack truncation. And what it does is, imagine you have your implant uh, in memory and you, it's executing from an unbacked memory region, so you have garbage in your, uh, in your cold stack. What this does is that I need to execute a frame zero function, a target function, a sleep, for example. And of course, all the frames are legitimate, like they are resolvable, uh, but the caller address is my problem. So how this is solved? Well. Track stack spoofer will use a trampoline uh, in its main module, but this is just because it's a POC. You can literally use any kind of trampoline you want in memory, even in, an, even in a DLL mapped in memory. And then it will zero out the, uh, the return address from that call. Uh, by doing this, the stack is truncated because the zero it corresponds to the bottom of the stack. When the unwinding algorithm encounters a zero address as a return address, it will just stop executing uh, because it's the bottom of the stack. Of course, the main limitation about this technique is that it will leave the uh, thread stack uh, known unwindable. And this may be a yaw, an IOC or not. 
depending on the specific systems, there might be programs that exhibit the same trait, uh, but it's not uh, that uh, common. But surely it looks better than, so in, 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 um, the first one is without track stack spoofer, and the second one is with track stack spoofer enabled. Of course, the second one is better, although, uh, although there is this, uh, this final call that is directly originating from the module, which is not ideal, but it's surely better than having the, um, the, uh, the garbage on the stack. The second one is called it's stack crafting. The main POC is called stack spoofer, and stack crafting is a technique that will take a, a good, like this, this technique is, is, is meant to protect from hook-based scanning, uh, and the, the point of the technique is that you have a target function that you want to execute, for example, opening an handle to Elsas, and what you do is, I will record on my system whatever legitimate function is calling that function from, an, from another module, I will record that stack, and I will forcefully create a thread with that stack, which is legitimate, and it's all loaded by the system, and then I will forcefully put the RIP, the instruction pointer, to the target function. So that would originate a thread which executes a completely crafted stack and a completely crafted, constructed um, whole stack, and can evade some sort of detection. And uh, the only thing you need to care, care about is then get the execution back on return and kill the thread or just restore execution somehow, right? And the, 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 the third one is stack cloning. Stack cloning always by William Burgess, like the previous POC. Uh, I didn't tell, I didn't tell that. Um, so Cold Stacks Masker implements this stack cloning technique, which is a bit more complex and it protects and is designed to protect on sleep. So during periodical scans, and what it does is that it will loop through all threads in the system searching for a function, which is looking for a thread which is in a user requested wait state. The reason is I need to put my thread on sleep because I have a beacon. I want to make it, I want to, I want to sleep most of the time, so I want it to sleep. And I search for a thread that is sleeping and it's using the technique I want to use. So for example, wait for a single object. And by locating the frame of this thread, I will just clone it. Easy, easy. Uh, and this is very effective as a masking technique, I would say. And then there is another approach, which is good, which is stack hiding. And stack hiding by CUDA is um, DABBA. I'm sorry if I pronounced it uh, horribly. Uh, but so the, the idea is to create, to convert the thread to a fiber. And literally, when I create the fiber, the fiber is acting as an evil fiber, so it can execute from memory, it can do a lot, of, a lot of other stuff. But then I create a second fiber, which will act as my sleep fiber. And the idea is that I can switch between one and the other every time I want. And when I, went, when I, when I need to protect my beacon and I need to go to sleep, I, I switch to the uh, sleep fiber. And when I need to execute something, I switch to the evil fiber. So this uses literally two stacks because the fiber, every, you can execute just one fiber at a time in a thread. And the reason because is when you execute the fiber, the stack of the fiber becomes the stack of the thread. So the, the main limitation about this technique is that, as I said, it protects on sleep because if you are not sleeping and you are executing the evil thread, the stack will clearly identify garbage uh, and you can't just use this for protecting on hook or on kernel inspection. And so we decided to develop something that we could use to generally protect against uh, runtime inspection. And we developed this, this uh, stack walking uh, approach. And what is the main idea? We want to trick the unwinding algorithm in thinking that our call stack is done in a certain way, but then we use a desynchronization approach on return to just restore the original stack. How we do that? So we need three things, three pieces for uh, making this recipe work. 
And so we have a target function that we want to spoof, and we need a set fpreg frame. Okay, so a bit of about F, set fpreg. So set fpreg is a function that you can define in assembly, uh, like that, it, that you can put in a Amazon uh, file. And the set fpreg frame is is a frame that inside the prolog does uh, contains an a win code that is uh, a UWP operation set fpreg. And what it does is that it will restore the original role of the base pointer. Why this is uh, why this is needed? Because of course, as I said, RSP can't be changed inside the body of a function, but there are some exceptions. I mean, if I need to do a dynamic stack allocation, how can I do that? Well, of course I can do that. I can I can call an allocate inside my function. So I can also use the RBP again as a base pointer or any other register for what matter. And I can use RSP then to be the um, be the stack pointer and base pointer of the inner frame. So literally what, what it does is that it performs this operation, move RBP RSP. This is very interesting, even if alone you, won't, you wouldn't understand why. But this literally is just saying, okay, I have an inner frame, please restore the base pointer. Of course, RSP will contain a reference to the main module because it will need to trace back, right? Then we have a push RBP, a push rag frame, and this will literally push RBP onto the stack. Now, maybe it's not clear why now, but let's imagine this, imagine this from the perspective of the unwinding algorithm. It means that at a certain point, that RBP is pushed on the stack. If it's pushed on the stack, we can modify it. And from the perspective of the unwinding algorithm, when you know I'm performing all the epilogues to trace back the cold stack, there will be a virtual function there doing pop RBP and then move RSP RBP, putting RSP to an arbitrary value. Because RBP is on the stack, we can modify it. So why this is handy? Because that means that we can literally put any arbitrary value in RBP and the cold stack will be reconstructed taking that RBP value in account. So we can literally say this RBP is in NTDLL and it will, no, that this would not work, but we can, we can literally put any arbitrary frame and the cold stack will actually be reconstructed by taking that as the frame that is the caller frame. Um, of course, if we do that, we need a way to, like, this, this will already work, okay? By doing this, we, and putting a suitable value in RBP, we can already hide the main module from memory. But there is a, prob there is a problem. Like, if we do that, of course, on return, this program will crash. So we need a way to restore execution. We can use timers like old stack masker. We can use another approach that is not the one I'm going to present you there, but it would not be stack move walking anymore. So what we, what we use is a combination of, not just not a combination, we will use a job gadget to solve the problem. We call this frame the synchronization frame. And this job gadget is just a jump RBX. You can locate it within a suitable frame. You locate this jump RBX in memory. And the reason why we select jump RBX is purely, is purely um, opportunistic. We could use any sort of job ROP or, uh, and I will discuss this later, or COP gadget, because RBX contains a function, a pointer to a function that we decide, we have full control of. So we can literally put any kind of gadget there as long as it, fit for, it fits for purpose. But because this will be too obvious, because we will have a job gadget on return, we also use a conceal frame to just be a bit more stealthy. And the conceal frame is just a stack pivot gadget, right? That will just, you, you find a lot of them in, in any legitimate function of Windows. In kernel base, there are a lot of these functions, so there is no problem in finding them. And the other RSPX is not really appearing in the middle of a function. It's literally the 
the, the end of the function. So it's, it's impossible to say this is a, this is a non-legitimate frame, non-legitimate frame. So on return, what happens? I execute my target function, and on return, I hit the stack pivot gadget that will jump back to jump RBX, and jump RBX will just completely ignore both the SF set FP reg and push reg frame. We don't care, and this is the reason why I said the return not available. I, I don't care, I just don't care about that. This will, this will hit, there is a, there is a error that should be from jump RBX, but yeah. Uh, was wrong. Uh, that this will hit the restore, that will remove all the frames, deallocate the space, and then restore execution in the main module. And the full technique is explained here, even though I don't know what you read. And when you hit the target function, what you can see from the unwinding perspective is literally that uh, that pseudo pseudo uh, stack. So you have RTL user thread that started address of return address, which is the suitable return address that we want to put RBP to, right? So, uh, and that would actually, if you, if you, if you, if you compile the main XC of the, 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 the POC uh, without CRT, that address of return address will actually be base thread init tank. And then you have four functions that are the frames that we selected, first frame, second frame, the jump RBX and the stack people. And then you have finally the the target the target function. So very legitimate frame, very legitimate cold stack. And just because it's fancy, and I spend a lot of time to do that for marketing purposes, uh, I, I give that. So practically, there is this main uh, executable. We select my God, we select the uh, the four frames. And these four frames will actually obscure the main executable. You call the spoof function, then on return, what happens is that you will hit the restore. The restore will restore the stack back, and you will, you will be returned to, my god, wow, how much is low? And it will return to uh, the main XC. That's it. So, I want to take just one moment to thank the contributors. Uh, this was an adjoint research, so I want to uh, thank Namazo. I didn't put it in the slide, but I want to thank Namazo for the original idea. Uh, we came to this independently, but we were kind of inspired by him. Um, and then I want to thank Waldo and Trickster, because they contribute to this uh, research, which is not finished. This is just the first... Uh, 30% of the research. We have some, something else coming up. Um, and then let's discuss uh, about defensive considerations. Okay, so the first thing you want to do to protect against every stack spoofing technique, including this one, is enable chat. Uh, chat, control enforcement, enforcement technolo technology, or HSP, hardware, uh, hardware stack, and uh, hardware enforced stack protection. It's very effective against this kind of techniques. If you don't know what it is, uh, there is the link at the bottom. Uh, and practically what it does, it creates a shadow stack. And this shadow stack is a list uh, of all the return addresses that, you, that your program took by calling a specific function. And this, this practically the cold stack, the one you can manipulate, on return is compared to the shadow stack. So the difference between the cold stack, the normal call, the normal cold stack, and the shadow stack is that the cold stack contains everything. So the return addresses, the parameters, everything. So you can and you can manipulate that from user land and kernel land. The hardware, the shadow stack instead is populated only when a call occurs, and it's completely hardware protected. So you can manipulate it even if you have kernel level access. The way it works is similar to return throw guard, which is something Windows introduced a while ago, but then discarded because it contained a lot of bugs. So they says just, okay, just let's, let's stick to Intel implementation. Uh, but it's literally the same thing. Like they populate this, all this return address. When you hit a return, they are compared if they mismatch. You, the program is killed. So all things that are relying on ROP in some sort of form will probably be a no more in like as soon as this is widely adopted. The only thing that saves us so far is that 
Uh, this thing was introduced, like the support for this was actually added in all Intel uh, CPUs from 2021, if I'm not mistaken. I might be mistaken, so the, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that it's literally very young as a technology, so there are a lot of legacy CPUs around, so it's going to take a while to, to actually see this widely adopted. But Windows is starting enforcing it. We, from Windows 11, so I guess we are approaching to that to that time. Um, another defensive consideration, until we don't have chat, is this. So stack moonwalking creates this completely valid, uh, like from an unwindability perspective, completely valid cold stack. But uh, as William Burgess already skimmed it out, I guess, uh, in one of his blog posts these frames are not related to each other. At least the current implementation of this stack more walking uh, um, technique is, doesn't produce, doesn't use frames that are related, meaning that it's very unlikely that this card virtual memory would call normalized string. Why? There, there is no real reason. Uh, so, so you can ant for this specific um, semantic kind of issues, uh, and if you look farther, I mean, we will release the detection algorithm very soon, but uh, the detection is based on the fact that, like, if you look at that memory, so like normalized string plus 66, you will see that before that operation, there is no call. If there is no call, then there is no possibility that function was called by anything. So, yeah, you have a mismatch there. So this is the this is the way you would hunt for this for this string. If you want to hunt instead for the gadgets, I would not recommend it because the point that I'm gonna take in the key takeaways. Okay, the POC is uh, here. Salem Mowok uh, is is public. You can go and and check it out. Um, and as I said, this POC is designed to obfuscate the stack around time. There are other, yeah. So for sleep obfuscation. <laughs> I put, uh, my, my bad, I put what I wanted to say too late in this slide. So for zip obfuscation, I would rather use another approach because this was not meant to protect the stack on, uh, on, on sleep. Why I say that? You can, of course, call wait for single object with stack moonwalk, but the more time you give a defender to analyze the stack and see and the more it will be apparent that something dodgy is happening, right? Instead, if you use this as in combination with a sleep obfuscation kind of stack spoofing, this would be very effective because you literally can execute anything from memory and the cold stack inspection will not be able to identify anything. So yeah, this is, this is probably the, it's, best, it's best suited to be used in combination with another uh, obfuscation op approach on sleep and use solid stack moonwalk for obfuscating cold stacks at runtime. And the thing I want to, to you to actually understand is that the the jump RBX was completely arbitrary. You can use another non-volatile register. You can use a push ret approach. You can use a call a cop gadget. And the reason you can use a cop gadget is because restore is on you, is completely arbitrary. So you can literally have a push, a pop rux at the start of the restore function and get rid of return address. So you don't need to care about that. So you can use cop as well. And, and it is possible to create chains of arbitrary frames, meaning that literally the concealed frames that you are adding, uh, I didn't show this here, but you can put arbitra an arbitrary number of concealed frames before the job gadget and after the job gadget, and the function will work as it is. Uh, doesn't matter. So you can create literally an arbitrary uh, arbitrary stack frame, like stack frames of arbitrary length. And the last thing you can actually look at this yourself. It will require a bit of research, though. Uh, it is difficult, but it's not impossible to create chains that creates val completely valid cold stacks. Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm not disclosing them, but it's possible. It's it's possible to create completely valid cold stacks with this. And that's it from me.